personally i don't struggle with this but i've seen a lot of immigrants struggle with this is the discussion as re- regarding black tax a lot of people have been beaten as a result of black tax a lot of people i would say like they are naive or i I don't know what the issue is but you can see every immigrant falls into two categories clear cut there is no middle line someone that manages black tax very well and someone else that does not manage black tax very well what do you think is the difference between these two people and um, for those people that are not managing it well, what does that look like and how can they move over to the winning side? <laughs> <laughs> that is a very key question. I mean, um, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and I'll say sometimes, well, I'll say the difference between an expatriate and an immigrant is that an immigrant pays backpacks. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, Are you for, sure for, expatriates they don't pay black tax? <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> but for, for your viewers who don't well, understand, black tax is basically sort of like money that, yeah. for instance, if you move to a new country, you're better well off. Or even if you're in your current country, yeah. because even when I was back in, uh, before I relocated, I still, you know, supported lots of people. So it's sort of like supporting your family and friends. You send them money monthly, maybe you're paying school fees and all that. And uh, black tax is sort of like, it's really good because traditionally we support our families, we're sort of like yeah. and all that. But for some people, it becomes such a burden. They're, they're, they're re- really um, working really hard, doing extra shift and doing all sorts and not having any sort of quality of life so that they can send money back home and all that to, to meet some expectations and all that. So sometimes it becomes, it starts to impact their mental health, impact their future. And guess what? When you're sending money back home, it's it's great, but you're also not investing. Um, So my approach to it, as someone who I feel I've paid my fair share and I'm still carry on paying with joy um, is, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do that. Um, But it's allocation and this, I I learned it from investing. So when I was a young investor at the beginning, you just saw a good opportunity, you went for it. But after a while, you started thinking, I don't want to just make money or lose money. I want to be able to go for a long period of time. So I started learning asset allocation. I'm going to not invest more than 10% of my fund into this particular opportunity. So even if Facebook is one of the best investments I've ever made, or I've, I've got investments in some stock market that have returned 500%, 600% over the last few years. And even if I knew that this was going to happen, even if Oh, someone woke me up in the dream, let's say, and told me this is the best stuff. I wouldn't go more than 10 to 15 to 20 percent. Yeah, so maximum will be 15 to 20 percent. So, allocation now take the same allocation to your finances the same way you are a chief financial officer in your life. Remember, rule yeah. one chief financial officer. What does chief financial officer do? You can either call it budgeting like yeah. the way the post is <laughs> yeah, but you right. can call it asset <laughs> allocation so yeah allocating assets i think asset allocation sounds more fancy it's still budgeting yeah. it's budgeting or, or, <laughs> or, or planning <laughs> or planning so what yeah. you're doing now is you're going to say you look at your income and say a percentage of this my income goes to supporting my family or for charity or whatever the same way you take out 15 to 20 percent goes automatically into saving or investing funds you can have a percentage of that automatically going out to fund you know whatever you need to do what that does is that every month you have money set aside that you can use to support your family friends people who are in need different sort of you know help and every month you allocate that money carefully based on needs which you pre-qualify example if somewhere where or somebody was unwell they were struggling they were they, they were about to become homeless versus someone who really wants to have a nice wedding and i think wedding is great but you have to cut your coat according to your you know whatever that idiom is you have to sort of like plan your wedding you want to go to the bahamas or Seychelles, but you don't have any money the other guy who is about to be homeless is probably going to be ahead of you in priority in being allocated my fund for that month. Um, The same thing applies. Um, That also means that if in a month you allocated 10% or 5% or whatever percentage of your income 
to this. If it runs out that month, it's run out. Yeah. Next month, you have another allocation. Whoever you weren't able to help last month, you might be able to help them this month. But again, not just because they've been on the queue. You have to reassess everything again. Maybe you would have helped them this month, but this month, it just happens to be that there was somebody who needs dialysis and they can access healthcare. And probably it might still take priority over this other person who wants to buy a new designer yeah. watch. Um, so if you, it, gave, it gave me a lot of peace once I got to that point, because since I've been 22, I've been sort of like selling money and all that. But once I got to the point where I'm thinking of it in terms of asset location, people who are going to get money from me monthly already know. And they're yeah. not sort of like coming up and calling me and telling me, oh, there's this issue going because you know there's an allocation coming. Yeah. The same way I get like an income and I manage my income. Once you get that money as well, you manage your own accordingly. Yeah. And if in the future there were a greater need, then we can talk about it and see whether we can make some adjustment in the allocation. So the key is making it automatic, making it sort of like planning for it, and then understanding that when you've done your best, that is the most you can do. Yeah. And there is one part that I want you to share how someone can handle. So someone will be listening to this and say, but this is, I can do all of this, but my family is different. So we know that there are some people in our families that are very, they are entitled. Yes, that's the word I'm looking for. They have that entitlement. They feel like because i know someone that have spoken to me and she practically cried on the call because she's doing her best but her family thinks she's not doing enough she has millions hidden in the uk because she's not sending wow they don't know that she's doing all the shifts she's struggling has her own struggles and stuff like that so how do we manage that expectation how do we have that discussion with our family and where do we draw the line like at one point do we just say see whatever is going to be is going to be like how do we go through that whole process it's very difficult um i've been fortunate in my own case um i think i'm fortunate because i can't say that um i mean the most people that who will who be calling me randomly and asking for money are not my direct family um, my parents, I wouldn't say that they, they mount me under any pressure. Um, it might have something to do with the fact that there's already an allocation. We all know there's an allocation. And if you want mm. to do it, do it properly, like do it adequately. Um, but if your family has very high expectations from you, um, a lot of it might involve explaining things calmly. Um, if you can afford for them to visit in the UK, it always helps. It's an eye opener because then they realize the sort of you know your lifestyle how you're working harder how you're, if, you, if you can arrange that it usually helps um but the final thing to say about that is that ultimately you cannot really control what other people do and i know we all love our families dearly but at some point you have to realize i can only control what i do how i feel i can only control what i say and at that point you have to make up your mind that while i'm still going to continue doing whatever i can do to help but don't get under sort of so much pressure to meet expectations that you will never satisfy.